Good morning, one more time. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get started. Hey, not bad, right? I like to start on time when we can. <laughs> welcome, welcome everyone. Please go ahead and take a seat. So you can't, is this better? Okay. If, uh, if I knock the podium off, you let me know, right? Okay. Welcome to San Francisco Caregiver Conversation, a day of learning, support, and information exchange. We're glad you're here. Whoops, I can't move, really. And uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us on Simulcast. We have a few folks that are joining us uh, in, a in the digital world. We named today's event, Caregiver Conversation, to reflect the importance of hearing from you, from those of you that are spouses, adult children, relatives, friends, partners, concerned neighbors, who are extending a hand, and sometimes two or three hands, to help care for somebody who's living with a chronic disabling health condition. Our goal today is to listen to you, to learn from you, and to incorporate what we learned today to help San Francisco become an even better place for caregivers to live and to work. I'm Leah Eskenazi with Family Caregiver Alliance, and I join you today in knowing that it takes a community, it takes a community, doesn't it, to support family caregivers and to make it, that support accessible to everybody. My family learned this firsthand. In the early 1940s, my grandparents settled into a house in the Sunset District. Uh, on 30th, between Pacheco and Ortega, if anybody's from that area, <laughs> um, English wasn't their first language. They spoke Ladino, which was a mixture of Turkish, Spanish, and Hebrew. And they um, didn't know anybody. It was, they were isolated. But as their English improved, and as they got to know their neighbors and the local shopkeepers, they started to develop some friendships. But it wasn't more than, well, it was really the, the mid-1950s that my grandfather started to develop some memory loss. And he, being a very stubborn, determined man, was not going to be deterred from taking his regular walks around the neighborhood, right? You know that story. So he would take off, but sometimes he had a hard time finding his way home. So most fortunately, we had helpful neighbors, helpful grocery store staff, helpful community police, and sometimes complete strangers who would find my grandfather and who would see the note that my grandmother stuck in his breast pocket of a sports coat when everybody used to wear sports coats, <laughs> and they would help guide him home. So it helped keep my grandfather safe, and it helped keep my grandmother uh, with some peace of mind. Um, and it, it just um, makes it possible when you have a community to care for somebody at home when you have that kind of network. Oh, sure, okay. Uh, sorry, station identification. There's a Toyota RAV4 uh, <laughs> Silver 84JJ308. I think that's what it, or 8YJJ308, and what's the issue? The windows are open. The, wind, for the windows are open, and we suggest you keep those, you close them for safety. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So it took a community then to help keep my grandparents safe and my grandmother having some peace of mind, as I mentioned, and it takes a community today in San Francisco to rally around family and friend caregivers to make it possible to care for a loved one at home, as I mentioned. Today in San Francisco, it's, 
We are so fortunate there is an exceptional group of community service providers who care about family caregivers and the people who receive their care. A select group of these providers have partnered with Family Caregiver Alliance today for this event, uh, but I want to note that there are even more providers in our community who are also providing important services and support. And to those providers who are here today, I want to invite you, if you uh, didn't have a table designated to you, these two tables right in the front here, you're welcome to put your materials there so caregivers can uh, find that material and learn about your services. Our partners for the event today are listed in your program, and I'd like to recognize them now. If you just kind of wave your hand, that would be great. Um, Alzheimer's Association, Benson Zhao, and there is Benson, thank you. Uh, Rachel Main couldn't make it today. Family Caregiver Alliance, Christina Irving, the uh, Institute on Aging, uh, Allison Moritz, Jewish Family and Children's Services, Tracy Debrum Ravova, Kimochi Inc., Sean O'Connell, Open House, Efrim Getahun, San Francisco Campus for Jewish Living, Christine Ropel, yay, uh, San Francisco Department of Disability and Aging Services, Kelly Dearman, thank you, Self Help for the Elderly, El Emily Chung, yay, there's, <laughs> I'm seeing waves, you may not be seeing the waves, but I'm seeing the waves. Uh, Stepping Stone Adult Day Healthcare, Dan Gallagher, there you go. And University of California, San Francisco Memory and Aging Clinic, Gloria Aguirre. Great. Thank you to our partners. Yes. Yay, partners. <laughs> Be sure to visit their information tables. I'm sorry about this back noise. And, uh, and also, uh, be sure to take some time to mingle with the other caregivers in the room, with the providers in the room, so that you'll uh, get a chance to exchange information and get to know each other. We hope that you'll take a, um, I wanna just state, uh, today would not be possible without the generous support from San Francisco's Meta Fund, who funded, uh, provided the funding for this event and supported lunch. I'm seeing some faces. Are you getting some different? Okay. <laughs> and also supported uh, lunch. Many thanks also to the San Francisco Campus for Jewish Living for hosting our breakfast. And to the Stupsky Foundation for supporting today's wellness activities. I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Monique Parrish. Monique, raise your hand, my co-coordinator for this event, who is a talented convener and brought superior organization, focused energy to our day to help make it possible. Thank you, Monique. Finally, there's just a couple housekeeping items. The goodie bags that family caregivers received when you checked in, they have a fun array of different things. They're not all the same. If you find something in your goodie bag, that you don't think you're gonna, if you can use it, wonderful, use it. But if you find something that you don't think you're gonna be able to use, please don't hesitate to give it to somebody else here or to a family or friend uh, in the community. And then finally, the bathrooms are in the lobby, uh, on both ends of the lobby. There's a water dispenser table if you get uh, thirsty at all. Uh, if you need a break from sitting, please don't hesitate to just stand up and go to the side or the back um, whenever that, uh, to make yourself feel more comfortable. Uh, this is a no smoking, this is a no smoking building. I think they would actually like you to go out to the street if you need to smoke. And if your cell phones are on, if you could either put them on silent or just turn the sound down, that would be fabulous. Um, I think with that, I would like to, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce We Are One. Will you please join me up here on the podium, the faith leader group from Japantown, from Japantown and Western Edition, who will be leading us in a non-denominational blessing for the day. Dr. James, Reverend Dr. James McRae, Sensei Masato Kawahatsu, and Sensei Elaine Donlin. Please.
The grace and peace of our Lord and our Savior be with you and with your spirits. We gather about midway through what in the Christian tradition is the season of Pentecost. We celebrate the outpouring of the Creator's Spirit, creating community, and then working through the relationships within the community to create, to make things new, to bring forth a new heaven and a new earth. Let us begin this celebration with an invoking of this sweet, sweet spirit. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, make us, fit us for this moment that through the time of communication and sharing, we would be one in the making of the community that we may care for and nurture one another in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everybody stretch, stretch and smile. Aha, in a laugh. Aha, aha, aha. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Reverend Masato Kawatsu, a sensei, laughter sensei. <laughs> Make everyone laugh. Uh, every morning I do a laughter exercise in Japan town. <laughs> so if you're interested, come down. <laughs> 8 a.m. every day. <laughs> so uh, uh, the uh, uh, I'm minister of a Congo Church of uh, San Francisco. Uh, they located on the uh, bush, 1909 bush. And uh, uh, I am represent the, uh, we are one group. Uh, it started about one and a half years ago. A community from the Western uh, addition, few more African American faith uh, communities and, and the ministers uh, from the San Francisco Japan town and Chinese American from the uh, China, Chinatown community and the others get together to do activities for the betterment of San Francisco and the world. So far, so far we had the four events uh, through uh, dialogues, prayer, and sharing our experience. We have learned so much and developed a great understanding and appreciation of each other. Uh, our fifth event will be uh, this Saturday at the Hamilton Recreation Center from uh, 12 noon to 2.30. Uh, it will be a center, children and safety, but not only children, ad uh, senior uh, adult also. Uh, in the Congo faith tradition, we clap hands four times before a blessing this symbolizes uh, working together between the universe and us, between parents and children, and people and uh, provider care and people who offer care. Please join together with the four solar clap, uh, or just put hand together. Okay, let's clap hand four times. <laughs> Thank you. Open your heart. Let us pray. Thank you for all blessing of heaven and earth. Our universe parents, the source of, source of origin of our life, we express our wholehearted appreciation for giving us priceless life in the past, present, and the future. Today, we gather here to support the many caregivers and organizations that support the important works of these special people through conversation, sharing, and learning. May we all feel supported in this important work and exchange valuable information and resources. Please give us your power, your love, so that we will be able to take care 
of our family, elders, patients, community, and ourselves. Arigatou gozaimasu. Japanese, arigatou gozaimasu. Everybody know that that means thank you. Thank you for everything. Mm. Thousand times a day. Why thousand times a day? Mm. Because no time to complain. Yeah. Thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> All right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Oseba ni narimasu, Japanese, which means I appreciate you for taking care of me. Yeah, and the uh, uh, Omede to gozaimasu, which means congratulations for happy new days every day. Every day wake up, Omede to gozaimasu, today happy new days. Everybody say each other, Omede to gozaimasu. Happy new day. <laughs> Clap hands four times together. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, senseis. My name is Elaine Donlin. Um, I'm a minister at the Buddhist Church of San Francisco, and I'm honored to be here with you today. Compassion is a significant concept in Buddhism. And it's taught that compassion begins with ourself, that if we don't have compassion for ourselves, then our compassion for others is incomplete. As caregivers, the challenge is often finding the balance between opening one's heart endlessly and accepting the limits of what one can do. So let us anchor ourselves in this preciously unrepeatable moment by simply breathing in and breathing out to the following caregiver's contemplation. May I offer my care and presence unconditionally knowing it may be met by gratitude, indifference, anger, or anguish. May I offer love, knowing I cannot control the course of life, suffering, or death. May I find the inner resources to truly be able to give. May I remain in peace and let go of expectations. May my caring experience help me to open to the true nature of life. And may I see my own limits with compassion. May I and all beings live in peace, live with ease, and die with ease. May we balance love for ourselves and others and balance compassion with equanimity. Thank you. Thank you. What a good centering way to start our day. Now I'd like to welcome Supervisor Connie Chan, San Francisco District Number One, uh, to come and to the podium. Uh, Supervisor Chan, you'll find more about her in the speaker section of your program, but please know that she is a tireless advocate for families and older adults. Supervisor Chan. There you are. <laughs> good morning, Zhou-san. Uh, it is so good to be with you here today. And um, to start off, I, I, I want to share uh, why uh, family caregivers uh, are so meaningful to me, um, but even more so, uh, now and uh, it's a personal story. It's a from a personal perspective. Um, about a year ago, uh, actually a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, for those of you may may or may not know my mom, her name is Irene um, Tam, and she worked for uh, Unlock for a very, very long time. Uh, she lived in Chinatown ever since we came to San Francisco when I was 13 years old. And that's a community that she lived in and served. Uh, she worked on the unlock sites at on Powell. She loved her job. And it's because she was working with seniors, caring for them uh, and their families, and, and help and support the families to make sure that their elders are well taken care of. 
So for all these years, she has been given to her, she, get, she gave to her community, she uh, was caring for uh, many, many elders and their families for a long time. And then a year ago, or a little bit more than a year ago, uh, I, I clearly remember it's, it was the Friday before Mother's Day. And she, and, and, and all of you may probably remember, it was, we were still in pandemic. And so uh, she and my brother and I, we got on Zoom. And, and she broke the news that um, she was found with pancreatic cancer. We weren't sure, you know, what stage it was, you know, but, but my mom was like, you know, let's prepare ourselves, you know. Uh, and, and of course, my brother and I were like, mom, like this, you know, who knows? Like, you know, you, have you done this testing yet? Has, have you done that yet? And she was like, not yet, but, but I just want to share with you. Um, within that three weeks, though, it was, is, it, it was such a blur for me. Uh, and... And my brother, he was living in Oregon and Portland at that time. He uh, decided that he, he's going to bring his, my two nephews and his wife, all of them, to, to my home and so that we can be together and try to care for my mom. Uh, but we are all still working. I, I was, I, at that time, already a sitting supervisor and, and trying to, you know, uh, brand new supervisors. I was, you know, new on my job and trying to, do this job as a supervisor, a policymaker during pandemic in San Francisco, trying to get our you know constituents vaccinated. My brother, you know, as a computer engineer, worked for Intel at that time, and and trying to work remote, and and we also trying to get our kids like on Zoom and, and go to school on Zoom, and trying to figure out how to care for the best care for our mom at that moment. And I have to tell you, you know, they say sometimes that it takes a village to raise a child. I say it takes a village to, rate, to care for our family members who are sick. It really, it really did for me. Uh, we found out my mom had terminal cancer, uh, stage four, and um, her friends came. Uh, her medical team came together. Uh, her colleagues came together. Uh, my colleagues came together. My uh, team, the people that I work with, including Angelina, you in the back, all came together to support all of us, my brother, my families, to make sure that we have that flexibility to put my mom first, to prioritize her care. But it wasn't easy, and it got me thinking, how do you do this day in and day out? At that time, we were like, how long is this going to last? And you want it to last, because that means my mom was still to be around. Um, but it, it, it lasted three weeks. Um, she passed away in her own home that uh, she uh, lived in for three decades uh, and peacefully with uh, her family and her grandchildren uh, all around her. And for that, I was grateful. But it was not easy. It was not easy because that moment, that one precious moment, took a village, a village of people that came together. And I believe that is what this event is about, to make sure that we hold that village together. We make sure that people gather and to share their experience and provide the support for one another, be it friends, be it colleagues, and be it all these organizations around you today. But also that's important though, from my experience that you as an individual family caregiver also have to reach out and ask for that support. There were moments that I have to say, there were moments, there were days where I'm, I'm like, I am the supervisor, I'm supposed to take care of everybody, I'm the mom, I am the big sister, I am the you know, daughter, that I'm supposed to do all of that and take care of everyone myself. You got to leave that space to allow other people to come because to help you to take care of you so that you can provide better care. And, and I think that it's important. And with that experience though, I also recognize this one thing. 
that uh, is the reason that I end up having this legislation that came forward. Uh, it's called Family Workplace uh, Ordinance, uh, a Family Friendly Workplace Ordinance. And this ordinance allows people to actually have flexible work schedule to take care of their family members, be it someone who's sick or be it their kids, uh, whoever that is to them. And it doesn't have to be their parents, it could be their siblings, relative, or family friend that they live with, uh, or not live with, but just show that this is someone that I have to care for, so that they actually have the flexible work schedule to go on and take care of their families. And because I know that if it wasn't because of the people that I work with, especially my team, that really stepped in and support and allow me that flexibility, and I recount those three weeks and thinking about all the moment when I, from the moment that I woke up to the moment that I went to sleep, I was grateful for any moment, any second that I spent with my mom. And even though there were moments that were just silence, the silence of me sitting next to her, and, and she was not the most responsive, but I was, I'm still grateful for those moments. So that is how I know every moment count, and that if, if people can actually have a flexible work schedule to take the moment out of that work and thinking about their family, caring for their family, and just simply be with their family is really critical. So thank you for all your service and thank you for all your work. Uh, please take the time to care for yourself and each other. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chan. I would like to invite, um, get my, my notes here all in order. Uh, I'd like to welcome Lorenzo Rosas to come up. Is that okay if I roll your R? <laughs> is that all right? Um, and uh, Lorenzo is the district representative for Senator Stott Wiener, a wonderful advocate in San Francisco for important issues such as affordable housing, LGBTQ plus rights, and other diverse community members. So please, Lorenzo. Hello. Thank you so much to Leah and, and Monique for having me here and, and being here to represent the senator. Um, as Leah mentioned, I'm a district representative with Senator Scott Weiner. He sends his remarks and wishes he could be here. Unfortunately, he's taken with the legislative calendar right now. Here, let me fix this properly. But I'm especially honored to be here speaking to you all um, and the Family Caregiver Alliance, especially because the organizing work and providing of services done by this organization and the many partners here speaks to the unending commitment of family caregivers to those that they care for and the best aspects of San Francisco and our society. When an individual does not neatly fit into health institutions, it's the incredible, awe-inspiring work of you all to hold up the fabric of society, to make sure that these people are cared for and that your commitment is fulfilled. I wanted to start my remarks first and foremost thanking you for all the work and recognizing your tireless commitment to those that you care for and the unending commitment to those and making sure that their quality of life is better. Coming from a young family, I was extremely lucky to be raised by my great grandmother, my Nana, who was an amazing woman and bought our first family house through divorce and became the matriarch of my family for generations to come. She quit her longtime job as the school cafeteria for the high school where my tias attended in Los Angeles to be able to drive me to school every year until the last year she had her license. And in many respects, I am the man who I am, and very much say the one-liners to myself of lazy people work twice as hard, or for example, because of my nana. Uh, the flip side of being from a young family means that you see firsthand the effects of aging on the generations that came before you. In my early adulthood, in my young teenage years, my, gra my great-grandmother, my nana, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and slowly but surely lost her memory. What originally went from her asking the same questions after the, an hour or so uh, generally went to a, an inability to recognize family. And now I, I know she knows who I am when she looks at me and she smiles and gives me a nod, but little else, little else. Following the initial diagnosis, it quickly became clear Nana needed 
assistance. She needed a caregiver with her. She could not live alone as she had for decades before that. And I'd say it's lucky that we have a large family to take care of her, but that really is the, the fruit of the sacrifices and love that she set forth in the generations that she sacrificed for. So we all chipped in, taking turns to be present for her mentally, while cautiously watching her every move. And it was really hard. It was hard for all of us. Um, and it just took a lot from, from every single person to chip into the family. And, and I think Supervisor Chan correctly mentioned it. It took a village. The, situ the situation for us became untenable when uh, several family members were diagnosed with cancer and ultimately meant that they couldn't be there in the caregiving role. And we needed professional services and were privileged enough to find care at a home very close to my grandmother who fortunately survived her bout with cancer. With access to greater care and professional supervision, I can happily say my great-grandmother, my nana, is still alive and very well. She watches her soap operas every day. General Hospital is her favorite. Uh, I share this story really to show personally how much I'm invested in, in this community and to add to the message that so many here will convey, such as Supervisor Chen and, and many after me. Caregiving is one of, if, if not the most, laborious and, and often tasking roles and responsibilities you can take, born from great love and deep compassion and empathy. And to the work done by FCA and the many partners here is life-changing for those who need the support, training, and resources, and those who receive the care that is enriched by these resources provided. I'm happy to say I'm here standing to represent a senator who understands these two points and fights to be a champion for this community and for the caregivers and the people who you care for. The senator supports legislation such as AB 1502 to reform badly operated nursing homes, but also in addition to affirming the, senators, or the Senate's uh, commitment to expanding Social Security benefits. Beyond legislation, he's been a budget champion for several elder-related issues, such as the California's Commission on Aging, uh, fund, new funding of a state position on geriatric, um, let me make sure I get this name, Geriatric Behavioral Health Leadership, which is basically the chief executive in charge of making sure older adult mental health related issues are taken care of. But beyond that, of course, the welfare of caregivers and those that they care for, the, those that you all care for, revolves around access to affordable housing, paid family leave, and access to quality health care. All issues that I'm happy to say and proud to say that I work for a senator who continues to fight for in legislation, in budget, and in advocacy in the community. So once again, I'm just going to say I'm extremely honored to be here. Thank you for allowing me to share my story. But most importantly, thank you all for the work that you do. It truly is holding up the fabric of society by caring for those who don't neatly fit into health institutions. And so thank you. And we are in debt to you for the care that you give. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Lorenzo. We have to fight with these masks, don't we? When you put them on, when you take them off, <laughs> it's a challenge. All right, thank you so much. Now, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce do uh, Kathy Kelly, who's ex Executive Director of Family Caregiver Alliance. Kathy's dedicated to improving the health and well-being of family, friend, and partner caregivers and for the people who receive their care. She works locally, statewide, and nationally as an expert consultant and hands-on innovator. Please read more about Kathy in the speaker section of your program. Kathy? Okay, I have to admit this is um, the first time, at least for events that we've done, that I've been actually in person seeing everybody. And after a few years of seeing everybody on Zoom meetings and masks and unmasks, sometimes I, I have a hard time recognizing some of you. So if I seem a little preoccupied, it might just be that I'm, you know, we're all trying to get back to some semblance of normal in our, in our lives. 
Well, good morning, and I'm really pleased to um, welcome you this morning. And I want to say these caregiver convenings for us have been um, such a, a joy of, to, to put together. Um, this is actually the third convening that we've done. We are a regional uh, program for our services. We work on the state and national level as well. And we've done convenings in Contra Costa County and Alameda. Uh, I've done a paper on this for uh, Santa Clara County some many years ago. And um, I was thrilled when we were going to do this kind of event in San Francisco. Um, I live in San Francisco. I'm a native Californian raised in the East Bay. Um, I love the city. And I have to tell you, um, from somebody who has the perspective of seeing states and regions and other counties, San Francisco is a very good place to be in. Uh, it's just, it just, uh, San Francisco just rocks, what can I say? Um, so, I want to do a little opening exercise, and I can probably tell that everyone's going to raise their hand at some point. And um, if you, I have three questions, and I want you to raise your hand. And if the next question is, the, you know, you want to raise your hand, you keep your hand raised. So, you can raise them more than once, in other words. Raise your hand if you are currently a caregiver. Oh, everybody. Raise your hand if you were previously a caregiver. Still more. Raise your hand if you expect to be a caregiver. Yeah. It's a ubiquitous experience, isn't it? Rosalind Carter said it first, and she said it best. There are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need to be caregivers. I want to say that Mrs. Carter, she's been a champion for decades for many, many issues um, that were not, not particularly popular. Um, one, uh, two of these were particularly close to her heart. One was on mental health issues, and the other one was on family caregiving. So I've had the privilege to um, meet and work with Mrs. Carter on family caregiving issues through the years. And I wonder if I can ask a favor of all of you this morning. And that is, today happens to be Mrs. Carter's 95th birthday. And uh, so we got the message. Al, I want you to come up. And I think standing up here would get a better picture. I, I want to take a picture of all of you. Uh, and sent it to her for her birthday wishes. And that we were, we were contacted um, by staff at the Carter Center, uh, reminding us that it was Mrs. Carter's birthday today. And um, I was uh, going through my notes and I realized we're having the best event for Mrs. Carter to be acknowledged at, and we should take advantage of it, because she has been one tireless lady on this issue. So if I could ask you all to just give a wave, I'm going to send this to her. I'll take a picture, too. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's, even better. that's even better. Go for it. Happy, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mrs. Carter. Happy birthday to you. Oh. That is lovely. I'm sure she's going to be thrilled um, about this. I, you know, I just have to say one thing about Mrs. Carter. I've oftentimes have had to meet, um, meet in, go to meetings that are in DC during the summer. And um, that's not the particularly best time of year for DC because it's very hot and humid. And coming from San Francisco, I don't know. For me, I just don't do hot and humid very well. And I always feel like I'm just sort of sweaty and disheveled. And I remember watching, I was feeling that way, and I remember watching Mrs. Carter come in with a beautiful outfit on, you know, not a sweat drop to be seen, very calm and collected. And I thought, I want to be you. Please, can I be you? Anyway. 
Um, you know, we were asked to talk about personal caregiver stories, um, you know, to, to really think about, you know, our own personal experiences and how this comes out uh, in terms of our daily work and for those of us who are in services or advocacy, how, how it manifests itself in that way. And we saw some examples earlier. Um, I'm going to tell you about my personal caregiver, I mean, my caregiver story through a journey that I experienced through care, uh, Family Caregiver Alliance because I was one of the original employees uh, for the organization uh, for starting 40 years ago. So the history started here in San Francisco. I don't know what it is, it's baked into the water here to be innovative. Um, and that was when Art Agnos, who later became mayor, was in the assembly. And he caught, got the attention of a, a needs assessment that was done before my time and he, on family caregivers. It was really one of the first needs assessments. This is 1979. And, um, and he wanted to introduce a bill from the recommendations from those reports. Now, I'm sort of a cynic at this point. I think nothing ever comes of reports. But somebody read that recommendation and took action, so that was, that was pretty thrilling. Um, so the task force that pulled together that um, report actually uh, led to became, uh, became eventually a Family uh, Caregiver Alliance and Incorporated in 1980. So they pulled together the ideas and language and that our uh, San Francisco Assemblyman introduced the first legislation in the country that recognized unpaid family caregivers, their contributions, your contributions, and special needs for services and supports, and a pilot project to test those services. Uh, and the target group for that was those that were caring for um, adults with cognitive impairments that were caused by Alzheimer's or related dementias, although it wasn't called that at the time, stroke, Parkinson's, head injury, and to lift restrictions so we could actually serve the missing middle. In other words, it was everybody. Everybody was included in this bill. So we, did, we ended up developing the pilot. There were, at that time, there were no programs there was no service models, there was no informational material, but we had a cadre of very dedicated uh, doctors and nurses and social workers, attorneys, rehab specialists, family caregivers that are all part of trying to collect what we could collect and, and uh, deliver a model of services that everyone shaped that, that pilot project. I have to say I came on during this particular period right when the legislation was getting passed and I would say that there is a definite advantage to youth in this regard. When you're young, you really can't see how tall that mountain is to, to move that rock up the mountain, that boulder up the mountain. So it's, there is an advantage to being young and dumb. You don't know what the obstacles are, so you just plow ahead, right? And so that's what we did, plowed ahead. But sometimes when I tell this story, I go, we were just making stuff up. Now, I, it wasn't quite that, but truthfully, there was no programs, no touchstones going on. When you're talking about 1980, nobody knew what a family caregiver was. So, um, we administered the program. We started getting calls from all over, all over the state, all over the country. Just people were desperate, you know, for this type of information. And he came back in 84 and said, we're going to replicate this and it should be statewide. Okay, so um, that, that bill passed and the caregiver resource centers, there's 11 that now serve regionally, every single county, all 58 counties in the state um, was created. We were then again involved in the creation and the codification of that type of, of, of the program. Um, with, you know, defining the services. By that time, we had learned a few things along the road, so we actually could put together an operations manual um, and to uh, really further those efforts statewide. And so, and recently, the CRCs took yet another turn. Um, the, um, we were involved in the development um, of these efforts statewide as well because we, uh, you know, we, we are one of the caregiver resource centers for the Bay Area, but we had uh, moved ahead to develop 
a HIPAA compliant interactive client record called CareNav and uh, knew that the future was going to rest in a combination of hybrid services, some of those being delivered digitally, particularly when we have a lot of working caregivers in our midst, and um, those that can be delivered in person, obviously. Uh, and based on that and based on the fact that we really need to move ahead with being able to, to gather the information, the data necessary to make those kinds of changes in, in policy and practice, um, we received $30 million in an augmentation to do just that across the state. And that was passed with a lot of work uh, on the part of family caregivers at the community level talking to their own legislators. Um, so, so we moved ahead on that level. So there's a lot of firsts uh, in the state, but I'm going to say not for San Francisco. I always say there's something here in the DNA of this particular city um, that brings people together. I just want to call out that, you know, Onlock and Chinese Hospital, you know, really developed the PACE model, which was taken nationally, is seen as a, as a model of care. We wish we had more of them across the state and across the country. Um, the AIDS crisis, crisis responded with many, many types of services and paved the way for the recognition and services like open house uh, and other uh, growing LGBTQ services and senior housing. So there's been, there's many others that I, I don't have time to mention, but I want to say that um, San Francisco has always been innovative, has always had compassion. Um, and uh, really uh, oftentimes um, puts their money, um, you know, where, where the direction of uh, the needs are in the, in the community. And I say this because I, you know, work with a lot of communities across the country, and, and San Francisco clearly is um, really um, quite, quite a leader. Um, as you can see, we all have broad working relationships with the uh, community providers. I want to shout out to all of the agencies that helped put this together and those that are here today uh, to distribute materials and, and so on. Uh, I also want to give a shout out um, to the Department of Aging and, and um, uh, Adult Services, DOS, uh, for their leadership during COVID. Now, I, I just want to acknowledge that it, it wasn't the first week that we shut down in mid-March, but it clearly was the second or so, it was very early. DOS got every provider in the aging network on a conference call to connect us with the latest information, with what was coming out from the Department of Public Health, health services, transportation. You know, in other words, when you're in a chaotic situation, information is gold. And they made that happen by a simple conference call and one person that they could contact, that we all could contact if we had any kind of question. They didn't know all the answers, we didn't expect them to, but they would go and find the answers. And as somebody who took advantage of that, I can tell you it clearly worked. My observation is, again, San Francisco led the way. And you know, every once in a while my husband and I go, oh, should we move somewhere else You know, when we retire? No, <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I'm not going to. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of great, great things. And also the Dignity Fund, which every other county uh, around the Bay Area envies that we have the Dignity Fund that was passed by San Francisco voters uh, for uh, improved social services and to support seniors, adults with disability, and family caregivers. Um, this too is extraordinary for the Bay Area region uh, and, and others are looking at, at this as a model. So what's the point of this history lesson for, for all of us? I think San Francisco has the knowledge and experience and the abilities to take on additional improvements and innovations and to keep moving forward uh, for, uh, on, on, the, on behalf of services and supports for family caregivers. Can the city and the county take on all of the naughty issues that we're talking about? Um, many of these issues, in particular for funding for families that don't qualify for Medi-Cal or are not, do not have veteran status, um, the, in, and particularly those that are in the missing middle, is likely beyond the capacity of just one county. 
but many things can improve the lives of family caregivers can be done here locally. Um, but to really, uh, 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 excuse me, to be done locally, but to really solve this issue for the missing middle means that we need to shift um, systems of care, health care, social care, housing, transportation, towards reimbursement to support community-based services for all families that have broader income ranges. That to me is the real heart of the matter, uh, at least at this point in, in my uh, evolution and development. On a larger note, um, because we do work a little bit broader than just the local or hearts in San Francisco, but we also have work that extends beyond, uh, we have recently moved the CRC system from the um, Department of Healthcare Services, where if you know the Department of Healthcare Services, it's a huge agency. I say our budget was like budget dust there. It's a rounding error, basically. Um, but we're now under the Department of um, uh, California Department of Aging on aging, and we're working uh, hopefully to bring a more focused lens to caregiving uh, issues and the integration of caregivers, you know, uh, within all of their different um, systems. And because we have a fairly data-rich uh, component, we want to make sure that the master plan on aging, which is, is making uh, rational decisions about how services are arrayed in the state, to make sure that they pay attention um, to um, that data and uh, in their data dashboard and how we make decisions about um, resource allocation. The final thing I say, I'll tell you is that we have started and launched, oh, five minutes, uh, a family caregiver coalition as well in the state. Um, so we'll be uh, keeping you posted on that. Um, onto the state report, we're really excited to have this. I think there's a copy that you all got. Um, and it really is an amalgam of interviews with families and interviews with providers, our data, data that we did in surveys, just taking a pulse of what is available uh, in San Francisco. And likely many of you participated in this and we thank you. I just want to say the key demographics, you know, for uh, looking at what our data in particular is that we have a very diverse um, uh, population, obviously. 60% of the um, caregivers are adult children. This is pretty common. Um, of those who reached out for help, it was 75% uh, female. And I tell you that because that, that number really hasn't changed in 40 years. Um, and 47% are employed full or part-time. There's a lot of juggling that's going on uh, in our community. And uh, to over two-thirds of the uh, uh, individuals needing assistance uh, are living with the caregiver. So um, the size of the problem is quite large. We projected or estimated that there are 90,000 caregivers in the county of San Francisco, 90,000. And the estimated economic value of what all of you do every single day is around $1 billion. Think about that for a moment. We, we have talked about the value in terms of relationships and commitment and community. I'm just gonna take a minute to talk about value in another way. And that is, of all of the stakeholders that are sitting here in the room, professionals and policy makers and providers and caregivers, really the most important stakeholder in the room are you the family caregiver. Without you, things would come to a grounding halt. So uh, sometimes I think, what would happen if all of the families went on strike? What would happen? It would, be, it would be pandemonium at the disco time. I mean, it just things would come to a grinding halt. Now, I'm not suggesting that you would or should go on strike. I'm suggesting that there is another value to consider, and that is you, the family caregivers, are the longest term long-term care workforce in our entire system. 
your economic, your contributions and economic value dwarfs many times over all public expenditures for care, health care, social care, whatever. I mean, you beat Walmart. It's 470 billion across the country, truly. And, and, and I, want, I say this because there is a value to economics. You have to know your value, and part of that is that you contribute not only to your family, because, you know, all of the things that we know about, but you contribute mightily to um, the, the support of the healthcare system and the social care system in our country. And I think that that value really has meaning to it, and we should pay more attention to it. I know we're a little nervous about talking about money in quite this way, but you have real economic power. And I'm hoping at this point that um, you know the hidden workforce, we're saying this every day up in Sacramento, in Congress, and the cities and the counties, we're saying this every day. Without family caregivers, we wouldn't work. As a, as a larger society, just general. Um, we know that uh, you know, all of you are caring for a long time. We talk to families along the continuum. Who we talk to most is when the care gets really difficult and personal, families reach out to us. Everybody needs something at any place along the continuum, that's to be sure. At the beginning, you might need information, some planning advice, some things to watch out for, some things to keep in consideration. But when care gets really hands-on, that's when families call us. And, um, and I think that if we were you know, thinking about how we, I don't know you say prioritize, but where we need to go to is really understand what those complex care issues and really start to think about how we address those. Because at some, you know, some points, people don't need so much assistance. They need some, but not a lot. But when they need a lot, it's really, really burdensome. Um, and this is particularly true for those that do not qualify for other publicly funded services, that, that lower income, missing middle that we keep um, talking about. So we've, we've nibble, nibbled around the edges about that with the Dignity Fund and others. But you know, on a broader scale, because I'm also a po policy person, we really need to, you know, we need to take a big chunk, a big bite out of the, um, uh, out of the budget that will support uh, more, more families uh, in the future. Um, <clears throat> so, one of the other things that came out loud and, loud and clear in this um, report was the issue of equity and access to services across all diverse communities in, in the city. And we sh should be and will be, you know, uh, making sure that we ha do a better job of that, I think, collectively across all of the programs. Um, and individually for, for us, because we are a diverse uh, city, it's a core value um, uh, that services take on. The report itself is to ensure diverse communities have access to family, these are the recommendations, by the way, have access to caregiver support services that are culturally and linguist linguistically appropriate, excuse me, to, uh, second one is to advocate for and provide an array of quality-driven, affordable, community-based services for all caregivers, especially for working caregivers. Remember, half of the caregivers are employed, uh, who typically require full-day services to maintain employment. Third, to increase uh, caregiver access to adult day and respite programs, which really do actually offer some opportunities, particularly for working caregivers with extended hours. And fourth, to identify and integrate family caregivers into health and social service systems to equip them with easily accessible and relevant information, education, training, and support specific to their situation. So those are the four takeaways from the report. Um, you know, I urge you to you know take a look. It's it's uh, mercifully short, uh, and um, uh, and it, it tells a lot about the progress that we've made to date in the city. Uh, and also gives some recommendations for how we can continue the, that arc of um, making progress uh, in, the, in the future. So I thank you.
for attending today, and I look forward to working on um, making San Francisco an even better place for all of us to age and thrive. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, that's a good, uh, good overview to start with. Now I'd like to give you a 15-minute break. Yay! <laughs> um, if you need to use the restroom, you want to get the breakfast uh, items will be taken away after this, so please get your last bits of coffee or orange juice. And uh, we'll see you back uh, at right about uh, 11. No, sorry. Oh, are we? Yeah. No. Yeah, because then we're going to set up, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. We have then we can set up. Okay. It was we're just going to get up and leave. That's all right. Um, so Bobby is going to help us. Go. Just move this up. Yeah, see the gentleman here speaks so loud. It's like, you know, having... Oh, 